Hey guys, Miss Marusek here, and in this video, we're going to talk about calculating heats of solution, which is the heat change associated with a dissolving process. Now, that dissolving process has some steps involved with it. So, before we get to the calculation, I actually want to look at the steps of a dissolving process. So, you notice those steps are illustrated here, where they are showing a solute has to separate apart. Our solvent has to separate apart, and then the solute and solvent need to interact with each other in order to form the new solution. And for each of those three steps, we can ask ourselves some questions. We could ask ourselves, are attractions breaking or forming in that step? Would that step be endothermic or exothermic? And would the heat change of that step be positive or negative? So what I want you to do is to take a moment and pause the video and see if you can answer those three questions for each of those three steps that we see illustrated in the picture. All right, did you pause it? Did you answer those questions in the example? I'm going to guess that you did. So let me go ahead and show you what I put for my answers for those three steps. So first off, in step one here, I notice that I've got to separate out my solute. So what that means is that I want to break attractions in that step. Now, depending on what kind of solute I have would depend on what kind of attractions I would be breaking. Um, for example, if I had an ionic solute, then I would want to break apart the ionic bonds that were there. Um, if I had a covalent solute, then I would only need to break apart the IMFs that were there. And when I break those apart, as we know, it takes to break, and so therefore that step would be endothermic, which means that step has a positive heat change for it. Now, the solvent, we notice it too needs to separate apart, and so we notice some similar answers for that step. The attractions on that step would be breaking, um, it would be endothermic, and so my delta H value would be positive. By the way, most of the time our solvent is water, and so more than likely, we are breaking the IMFs that were present there. Um, the hydrogen bonding, the Lenin dispersion, and the dipole-dipole forces, those would all need to be broken. So now I'm going to put those together in step three. And so when those interact, I'm going to end up forming new combination types of forces. Um, so for example, let's say I put an ionic with water. That means I'm going to form those ion-dipole forces between them. Or let's say maybe I put, try to put um, maybe some sort of nonpolar with my water. Um, obviously, we know those don't mix, but if they were trying to form a solution, we know that the new ones that would form would be the dipole-induced dipole forces. So that's where we could get those combination names of attractions if those forces did form. Um, but in any case, the key thing is, is in that step three, the IMFs would be forming, so therefore the process would be exothermic, and my delta H for that step would be negative. Now, obviously, not all dissolving processes take place. It depends on what's happening with the IMFs. Are the new IMFs that were forming either similar in strength or stronger than the original attractions that we had? Um, if the original attractions are significantly stronger, then I'm not going to form those new attractions in the place of the old ones. Um, Y'all might remember a video back in Unit 3 where I talked about I'm not going to break up with Chris Evans to go date somebody I'm less attracted to. I'm going to always break up with whoever I'm with to go date Chris Evans because that's who I'm most attracted to. And so solutions do that same thing. So hopefully that kind of rings the bell from our discussions back in Unit 3. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the overall heat change, though. Um, the overall delta H for forming a solution would be the sum of those three steps up above. So, you know, the two positive breaking forces steps along with the one negative forming forces step. And depending on kind of which is bigger will depend on if our overall dissolving process is endothermic or exothermic. Um, if the original two delta H's for breaking the forces are combo significantly higher than the freed energy when I form the forces in the solution, then overall my delta H is positive. And so that would mean that it's endothermic, and if I felt my container, it would feel cold. Um, however, on the flip side, if the heat that I release when those IMFs reform is significantly bigger, than the energy I put in to break, then overall 
the delta H would be negative, my process would be exothermic, and it would feel hot. Now, I'll be honest with you, most dissolving processes are exothermic. Um, the reason why is because if I'm releasing more than what I put in, that means that my product is typically more energetically stable potential energy wise. I'm going to, from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy. And that's always more thermodynamically favorable. Um, however, there's other things that play a role into that. So we can get dissolvings that are endothermic. That just happens to be way less common. Most of the time our dissolving processes are exothermic. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and flip the page and look to see how we would do a calculation for the heat of solution. Now this is going to be using the idea of calorimetry. Um, so we are gonna be using the MC delta T equation just like we did on other calorimetry problems. However, we are again going to have to address the idea that the heat change of the system is the equal yet opposite heat change of the surroundings. Uh, what's going to be awkward here is kind of like we saw with reaction calorimetry, uh, there's some overlap between what is considered part of the system and the surroundings. If I think about how I would do this in a calorimeter, um, I would have my coffee cups or whatever I'm using for my calorimeter, and I would put in my water, and then I would put in my solute and let them dissolve and measure the temperature change. That, it's that simple to do this kind of problem. Um, however, What's actually considered the system is simply just the dissolving equation itself, the breaking and forming of those new attractions. What that means is that the water and the solute are actually considered the surroundings. Now I know some of you are thinking, but wait a minute, Marusik, I thought that the water and the solute are what's actually doing the changing. Well. That's where that overlap comes in. Even though they are doing the changing, the change itself is considered the system and those substances are considered the surroundings. So I know that's really confusing and I will tell you the one thing that's affected by whether or not you get these two mixed up and that has to do with the sign of the dissolving process. So what you're gonna need to do on these problems is just like we did with reaction calorimetry, we are going to need to stop at the end of a calculation and ask ourselves, okay, did the temperature go up or down? Would that mean it's exothermic or endothermic? Would that mean my delta H of the system, the process, does it need to be negative or positive? We're going to have to stop and ask ourselves those questions to make sure that we got the signage on the process of dissolving correct. Now, it gives us some helpful tips when we're doing these kinds of problems here. First off, it does mention that as we're doing the MC delta T calculation, for the surroundings, uh, the mass is actually going to be for the entire solution, meaning both the water and the solute together. So kind of like we did with reaction calorimetry, where we had to add those two reactants together to get the amount that we put into the MCAT, we're gonna be adding here the water and the solute together to get my mass that I put into MCAT. Okay. Um, also, as I've already mentioned, we're going to double check our signage at the end of the problem. That's going to be really important to do. And then last but not least, uh, when we get our dissolving heat, uh, we're going to use that to find the standard delta H of solution or heat of the solution. Um, it's a value that shows how many kilojoules would be released if one mole of our substance dissolves. Now, what's awkward about delta H of solution is that it uses that subscript of solution like we saw here with surroundings, but really this is wanting the dissolving process itself. So we're going to have to be kind of careful there when we calculate that because those subscripts can get a little bit confusing when we're talking about those labels. All right, so with that said, so let's go ahead and talk about our example here. <clears throat> 
And so we see that they are asking us some questions about the dissolving process of sodium hydroxide in water. And the first question they ask us is what kind of attractions would be broken in NaOH when dissolving? Now, we need to ask ourselves what kind of substance is NaOH? Well, that's an ionic compound. And so for an ionic compound, when I'm dissolving it, or melting or boiling it, um, I'm gonna be breaking ionic bonds. Remember for ionics or metallics or network covalence, when I do those changes of dissolving, melting or boiling, I'm always breaking the bonds that are present. However, for covalence, I've gotta be careful. Covalence, I would be breaking intermolecular forces. So for example, on part B, when it asks what kind of attractions would be broken within water when dissolving, water's covalent, and so I want to think about the IMF types that are present, London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Obviously, the hydrogen bonding is the dominant type, but all of those other intermolecular forces would still be getting broken as well. So then on part C, it asks us what kind of new attractions would be formed between the NaOH and water. And this is where I have to do those combination types. Um, so with the ionic bonds, when I combine that with something that's dominant hydrogen, I can't keep the hydrogen bonding name unless both things have hydrogen bonding in it. And so I have to revert back to the dipole part of this. And so I would call it an ion dipole force. Now, technically, you have London dispersion forces as well, um, but those are kind of secondary to the ion dipole forces being the dominant new type that I formed. So then on part D, it asks us to write a dissolving equation for the dissolution of sodium hydroxide. So we want to remember that sodium hydroxide is ionic. And so when I put that into water, it should dissociate into separate ions. So I end up getting sodium positive one aqueous and hydroxide negative one aqueous. We want to make sure that we show charges with these. And as far as states is concerned, um, the ionic should be a solid solid to start out with um, because that's the state that almost all ionics are at room conditions, um, but then our ions should be aqueous because now they're dissolved in the water. So now let's talk about the calculation here because this is where things get really interesting. It says that, hey, I have a mass of sodium hydroxide dissolved in a mass of water. They give me some temperature information here. And what they want us to do is to calculate the heat change when the amount of sodium hydroxide dissolves in water. And they give us a specific heat value here that we can use. And I'm like, well, hold on a minute. Specific heat, temperature changes, masses. That kind of sounds like I'm doing an MCAT. And absolutely, we are doing an MCAT calculation here. So with that said, though, we have to be careful about this idea of system versus surroundings. This reaction right here that we wrote, this is our system. This is what is actually changing in that process which means the substances hanging out themselves are actually the surroundings. So this dissolving process up here that we wrote would have the equal yet opposite heat change to what the other pieces in the solution are doing. So this we're gonna be solving with MCAT. Um, and you can see that based on the data that we have up above. Now we have to be careful when we're doing the mass, because the mass of the overall solution is technically the sodium hydroxide and the water combined together. Just like we did on reactions where we added up the two reactants, we've got to add up here the water with the solute that I'm putting into it. Um, and so you notice when I add those up and maintain the two places past the decimal, that gets a mass value of 151.10. So then I multiply it by the specific heat that they gave me. Um, they chose to use just 4.18 instead of 4.184, so use whatever number they give you.
And then I have my temperature change here, final minus initial, and maintaining two places past the decimal, that gets a temperature change of 1.82. So when I calculate that, and I'm going to use three sig figs based on the temperature change, that gets a heat change of positive 1150 joules. But that is the kinetic energy change of the surroundings. The system's potential energy change is equal yet opposite to that. So it is a negative 1150 joules for the dissolving process itself. Equal but opposite. Okay. Now, if you're in doubt about that sign being correct, here's what you can ask yourself. Is that process endo or exothermic based on the temperature change up here? Obviously, I can't feel inside of a calorimeter, but if I could, if my hand was magically inside of that calorimeter, if that temperature is increasing, then that means it would feel warm to the touch, which means that heat is going from the system as potential energy that I can't feel into the surroundings as kinetic energy that we can feel. And so that process should be exothermic, and therefore I should have a heat change that's negative, which in fact that's what we figured out it to be. Um, and so that can be something that you ask yourself every time when we're doing these calculations is based on that temperature change, should that heat for the dissolving be positive or negative based on the fact if the temperature went up or down. So then finally, I want to calculate the official heat of solution in terms of kilojoules per mole of the NaOH. Now again, be careful here. I know we just talked about, you're like, okay, you just said solution was part of the surroundings and here they use delta H of solution. I know somebody did a bad job with that. I really would have preferred that they put delta H of dissolving, but they didn't ask me and so we're just going to go with it. So be careful when you get to this part. Um, the issue is, is that while I have the heat change of the dissolving process, that was specific for the 1.10 grams of sodium hydroxide that I dissolved. And you can kind of think about this as your limiting reactant for that dissolving process. You are more than likely going to have plenty of water to dissolve that NaOH. So kind of like we did with reactions, I'm going to use that limiting reactant to figure out a heat change per mole. Um, and so what I did first is I converted my grams of NaOH that they gave me into moles of NaOH. And then I took my joules converted it into kilojoules and divided it by that moles of NaOH. And so what that means is that if I were to dissolve an entire mole of NaOH in the water, I should be releasing 41.8 kilojoules per that mole of NaOH. All right, I hope you're feeling good about calculating uh, with heats of solution and kind of have a better understanding of all the things that have to happen for a dissolving process to take place. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.